Greetings, mobile accomplishers. Welcome to the Verge Mobile Show. It is episode 45 for the week of April 29th, 2013, but you don't really care about the date and the episode number. What you care about is who's here. Uh, I am Dieter Baum. I'm Dan Seifert. I'm Chris Ziegler. I'm David Pierce. Hey, we've got David Pierce here, a very Hello. special guest. Uh, he's here to talk about uh, peanut butter and banana sandwiches. That's true, actually. Um, I had one of those yesterday, by the way, <laughs> and it was phenomenal. It's the best thing ever. Like, so, no, like, it's only phenomenal honey, if you put really honey on it. Right. Yes. No, no, no. 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 He gets the, makes the bread all crunchy and crackly. You've got to put Nutella on it. You're both wrong. Uh, the way you do a, pr a proper peanut butter and banana sandwich is with peanut butter and banana, hence the name. And you, you have to use the right peanut butter. I'm using a, a an artisanal peanut butter from <laughs> New York City, may I add. It's from New York City. Uh, it's from, I think it's just called the Peanut Butter Company, right? Um, that sounds like a New York kind of company. Yeah. Uh, it's like, we invented and, peanut butter. Don't ask questions. Right. And it's got like cane sugar in it and all this garbage. Listen, but, uh, if it's not the way Elvis didn't make if it's not the way Elvis made it, I don't care. Mash the bananas, add bacon, grill it up. Grilled would be good. I'm not going to lie. Uh, so I, I was just thinking about something. You know how we used to for a long time. This actually predates the, the mobile show. This is when we were audio only. We had the, uh, the variations of the number three. Well, since we added Dan, we never oh my God, I thought totally about... Forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, we never thought about doing variations of four. So this opens us up to an entire, entirely new dictionary, basically, that we can probably carry for months on end. Yeah, we we just kind of just gave up trying to come up with different uh, variations. Yeah, we we ex yeah we we exhausted the supply of synonyms for three, but now we right. have synonyms for four. Right. I can think four of quartet, synonyms. and that that's all I've got. Quadruple. Oh, you're you're just scratching the surface. So man. I can do this one time, and then I have to leave forever. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we had a whole lot of actual, real, genuine mobile news this week. Uh, a whole lot happened, and uh, we. <laughs> are here to talk about it. And I think the the biggest uh, thing that happened is we had a review of the Galaxy S4. And David is not at all tired of talking about no, the Galaxy S4. Not even a little bit. <laughs> Have you got one with you? Is there I one? do. It's right here. It's also, I like to play the fun game called Which One is the Galaxy S4? <laughs> um, and the thing is, Everybody always loses. <laughs> no matter knows. who wins. The, the <laughs> right. only way, even the if only you're, way, right, you're right, you still lose. Well, the, the, uh, you know, the, the dead giveaway is the number of sensors around the earpiece, right? Right. Because the GS4 has an additional sensor. Right. Because That's... otherwise, how would you wave your hand over your phone to tell it to do things? Right. No, the, the gesture where you, like, wave to, like, move an icon between uh, home screens is, like, this thing, like, that is the, like, if you had to boil down Samsung to a microcosm, like, that is it. Like, that, that tells you everything you need to know about what Samsung Mobile yeah. is doing right I like to now, imagine that it... Samsung has, like, the same sort of 20% time thing that Google does, but then they just take everything and they're like, yes, put it in the phone. <laughs> <laughs> now, the it. important question with the gesture thing is, can it tell the difference between a slap and the back? Back of the hand, like if you give if you give the phone the back of the hand gesture, does it do something different? Does no, it turn the actually, other cheek. It, yeah. it should yeah, it should say thank you. May I have another? Um, <laughs> no, unfortunately, it, it doesn't, and I kind of wish it would. And so you kind of get to the point where like you feel cool, and you can just be like super subtle with the gestures as you go over it to make it do stuff. And that's like when you're a real power user of the GS4. But like, there's there's so many other gestures they could have done. Like th they could have done this to force close apps. You know the thank yeah. you that thing that would have been great. Uh, okay, so Galaxy S4 basically like hopefully if you're watching this you have read uh, the amazing review uh, and the gist of it is and this is also on top shelf for quite a while. The gist of it is like it's a really 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 good phone that nobody really here is all that interested in. Yeah, I think that's fair. <laughs> I mean, and, and it's it's been really interesting to see all the, the feedback to this review because I think, like, a lot of people... Uh, we, we have this great benefit of being able to use all of these phones. Uh, and in some sense, like, if you've never used a phone like the HTC One, uh, the Galaxy S4 is going to feel fine because, you know, six months ago or two years ago when you bought your last phone, like, this is just what phones felt like. And in a lot of ways, it still is. But now, like... 
we've sort of seen the light and like once you once you play with these better design phones like the Lumia 920 or the HTC One, then suddenly this just doesn't feel as good anymore. Even though for most people, it's probably what they're used to. And I don't I don't know quite what to do about that. It's like just go play with this other phone. I promise it's better. Yeah. So I want to I want to tell a little story. So. Um, HTC releases a really well-designed one phone uh, to pretty good reviews. Uh, they managed to get it out the door just in front of Samsung's new phone. Yep. Samsung, uh, its phone comes out, uh, the reviews come out a little bit later um, than the, the one reviews, and people are like, this is a really good phone. It doesn't feel all that great in the hand. And then Samsung proceeds to completely obliterate HTC. That was the story of 2012, and I feel like we could just like copy and paste that onto what's going on with, in 2013, like it, like like the only thing that changes is you take the X off of the one for HTC and you switch the three to a four on the Galaxy S. I don't know if I'm convinced that that's true. I think you're probably right, Dieter, and and I certainly would have been on board with that uh, theory a, a couple weeks ago. But I was in an AT and T store over the weekend, uh, and I was shocked. Uh, Dan, I know Dan, you, you wait back up. What, why this. were you in an AT and T store? Because uh, I, I owned a GS4 for about 18 hours. Oh, you, um, you returned it already! Wow. Oh my God, I That's yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. We'll get to that in a minute. But <laughs> but uh, the um, the the store rep was uh, was really really bashing the GS4, and he was like, you know, look, there's no comparison. He, he pulled one out of his pocket, and he's like, this thing just feels so much better, mm-hmm. and it's obviously like a completely different design. Uh, but the GS4 just feels and looks like a GS3 to me, and he's absolutely right. So if, if that is the sentiment that's, that is being shared by a majority of the at and and carrier reps around the country uh, this week, that might end up steering the kinds of people who are looking at the GS4 right now, not knowing a lot about these devices going into the store, that might steer them in, in the direction of the One. So they might actually have better success with the One than they had with the One X uh, this time last year, I think. Yeah, I'm well, sort of surprised to hear that, actually. And like, if I'm, if I'm HTC, that should be super encouraging, because Samsung... It seems like they, they just became sort of the default, and you'd walk in and be like, I want a phone, and they would just immediately be like, here's the GS3, it's pretty good, you'll probably like it. Uh, but if HTC has sort of commandeered some of that away from Samsung, that's, that's huge. Well, there's a right. couple of other things that HTC did right this year that it didn't do last year, wasn't able to do last year. Uh, this year, it's got the one on Sprint, T-Mobile, and AT&T at virtually the same time, and it's a virtually the same phone. Uh, whereas last year, uh, AT&T had the One X, but... T-Mobile had the One S, and then later on in the summer, the Evo 4G LTE came out, and then Verizon didn't get an H- interesting HTC device until, like, December. Um, you mean but, that, you know, that there's that the rumors that, that, that uh, Verizon will have a version of the One in by May-ish or something like that, so that is encouraging for HTC. I still think it's got a very, very, very difficult path ahead in order to, you know, defeat Samsung's marketing and, you know... Uh, there's a lot of things that Samsung has going for it between the massive support from Best Buy, like the Galaxy stores within the store that Chris reported on a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're not going to see an HTC store within a store. So it's everywhere you go, the Galaxy is thrown in front of you. Uh, and I know David mentioned this quite a bit in his review when people talk about buying a new phone. It's like, oh, I bought a new iPhone or I bought a new Galaxy. I didn't buy an Android phone or I didn't buy an HTC unless you are like really into phones. So it, I think there's still a, a, a hard road ahead for HTC. Yeah, no doubt. But Dan, I mean, uh, two, two HTC's, well, not HTC's credit, but, but Samsung's downfall, you pointed out <laughs> that when you were in uh, your local Best Buy, there wasn't a soul in the Samsung experience. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was like, quite deserted. Now, to be fair, uh, we, we noted that this was before the Galaxy S4 was really, is really available. So, you right. know, I assume that's going to be different once the Galaxy S4 is actually on shelves and, you know, Samsung is advertising it every other minute and uh, people are walking and looking for it. But, yeah, when I was there, you know, I, I strolled right through the empty Samsung, Samsung uh, display booth. But, hey, you know, an empty Samsung display booth is better than a non-existent HTC one, I think. Right. <laughs> so the, the differentiating factors between these two phones for me, I mean, one, obviously we, we think the hardware is way nicer on the HTC one. Yep. But, um, you know, HTC took this giant risk with the camera that's technically four megapixels and the, the ultra pixels or whatever. So um, I'm really curious to hear more about the camera on the S4. Because, David, you, you seem to really like it. It's really, really good. I'm just sitting here, like, scrolling through pictures, and I can just... This is ridiculous. 
But um, no, I mean, I think it's it's the best Android camera I've ever used personally. Um, and for me, it's it's very much a you know personal preference thing. Like I don't spend that much time taking pictures at night in dark places. And if you do, then the one and the Lumia 920 just blow this out of the water. It's not it's not good in low light. It's very much like the iPhone 5 and another like any other Android camera in that sense. But just in terms of like I, I really just don't buy what HTC says where like pixels don't like the, the megapixels don't matter. It's just like a 13 megapixel image when you blow it up or look at it and anything other than like the five inch screen on your phone. Like if you want to put this on your computer and actually do stuff with it, the more pixels there is just more data and it just it's sharper and this camera is incredibly fast and they have just the most ridiculous number of software features and crazy stuff you can do. Uh, but it mostly just boils down to the camera takes really good, really accurate and sharp pictures, and the one just doesn't. It does some nifty things in low light, but this ultimately just takes better photos. And like for me, that's kind of the whole ballgame. I mean, honestly, other other than like playing around with all the extra nifty features, though, like I'm sorry, what, isn't there a feature where like you take a picture and it records like five seconds of audio when you take the picture? I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah, it's, it come makes on. no sense. And so and the idea is like, oh, it's a postcard where you take a picture and you're like, hey, Grandma, thank you about you. Happy birthday. And like, David, no I, I do have to say that you're, uh, the picture in your review of you <laughs> in, I think you're in like Times Square yeah. with like your, your face in the heart is like the best thing I've ever seen <laughs> on The Verge by far. Well, it's well, not even you, close. I mean, that's like the whole reason I did this review, if I'm being honest, <laughs> was to do that. Um, I just wanted to take a picture of me in a heart in Times Square. No, and that's another thing that, like, Samsung makes this big deal out of all these different features and all the different things the camera and the phone can do. And this dual shot thing where you can take a, a photo with the front and back camera at the same time and sort of superimpose them on each other is just absolutely useless. Like, I can't think of a single reason I would ever actually want to use this in life. Like, oh, let me cover a quarter of my image with my face awkwardly framed in the front camera. And, on the side of a building. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yet, Samsung spends all this time talking about this instead of, you know, any of the other things they could be talking about. And it's just right. strange to me. Yeah. So, so is the just, like, if you care about the way the phone looks, then you want the one. But if, if you want, you know, utility and expandable memory and a replaceable battery and a better camera then you want the S4 and, you know, no shame in that. Is that, is that I mean, that sounds, and that, again, that sounds exactly like the story last year. If you want something that is, you know, super useful and gets mm -hmm. done. I mean, the, the Galaxy S3 was my phone for CES because I was like, well, I need a uh, powerful, fast Gmail access. I need LTE and I need to make sure that I'm not going to be stuck with a dead battery at the end of the day. And I was like, well, all those things put together lead, led me to the GS3. Yeah. You think that, that, like, it seems like there's a there's a, just the same sort of calculus for the, the GS4 if you're looking, you know, deciding between these two phones. Well, I think to, to me what's, what's partly really interesting about the One is that it, it used to be sort of you bought the iPhone if you wanted a phone that just worked. Uh, and you bought an Android phone if you wanted to tinker and do sort of weird customization things and you wanted expandable storage and you wanted a removable battery and you wanted all this different stuff and HTC skewed, it seems to me, skewed a little bit toward the Apple route of saying like this is our phone, it's beautiful, it works, you'll like it, we promise, just buy it. Uh, and like, and other than like Blink Feed, which just remains a travesty of everything for cell phones. Um, it, it works, I think, and it's, it's a beautiful, well-designed phone. But yes, if you want all the tinkering and all the customization, um, you should probably buy the GS4 because it has a removable battery and it has expandable storage, and the One doesn't have that. But I, I'm personally really excited about the fact that there's actual options now if you want to have an Android phone that is beautiful and usable and friendly for all the same reasons the iPhone is. And I think that's great. What, uh, what version of the G how much, how much uh, RAM storage do you have in your GS4? Uh, your I believe it's 32. Is it 32? Because there's a thing going around that the 16 thing, like a whole bunch of storage gets taken up by the OS and all the extra Yeah, features. it's like the same thing Microsoft went into with Windows 8 where it's like half the storage is gone because of all the crazy stuff it's trying uh, to do. So you're like really going to want to use that SD card slot apparently yeah. to so, get the 16 I mean, gig version. 
that only gets you so far, though, right? Like, if you've got, say, a big game, like, say you've got Asphalt 7 or something, which is, like, 1 or 1.5 gigabytes, I don't think you can move that to the SD card. So uh, if you are a gamer or using these big apps, then, you know, you're going to want to have more storage, either the 32 gigabyte version or what. The ex- yeah, external if you're a gamer, you shouldn't be buying an Android phone. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, Sorry, I mean, these 1080p thing. displays, games look pretty great, so. Yeah, or, the, the three that actually are decent look pretty great. <laughs> Touche. I'm a huge. I don't know. I'm a. I'm a huge Android gaming hater. So like the Ouya and the Shield make no sense to me because like nobody's making. Yeah, I I, I completely agree with you, Dieter. Like I, I the Ouya is a, a a product that I just do not understand. Just because Android gaming has not succeeded on what Android's native platform is a mobile device, why would I want it on my TV? But you know. Well, and and just adding to that, so for the um, for the fleeting moment when I owned a GS4 this week, and I was yeah, oh hang on, I was back, noticing... back. no, 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 stop, just stop. Just, <laughs> before you go into whatever I love how he just tries to glass game. right over it. <laughs> you need to explain what happened here because you're like, if if you guys aren't familiar with uh, Mr. Chris Ziegler, he's pretty well known for like buying a phone and then selling it or immediately getting rid of it. And he's also well known for like paying way too much for a phone just to have it and then like realizing he's made a terrible huge mistake and then getting rid of it a couple of days later. Um, this happened with the Nexus 4. You need to tell us the story behind your purchase of a Galaxy S4. What color uh, and why and like why don't you have it anymore? Well, I, I, it's it's really simple. So I you know, I, I have a, a one review unit. Uh, it, it's not uh, you it's international unlock, so no LTE. Um, and the 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 back order for the US LTE unlock version, which is the, the real prize, the real gem, which is in Dieter's pocket right now, yes, um, is. is is way, way out right now. They're showing like if you go to HTC site, there it says ship date five twenty eight or something like that. Um, and no human being, much less somebody like myself, is that patient. Yeah, so you have four phones by then. And I, and I I, yeah, I, I already. Yeah, I mean, like the Galaxy S8 is going to be out by by May twenty eighth. <laughs> so, so now, to be uh, fair, like I ordered mine, they said it was going to be two to four weeks before they shipped it. They shipped it within a week. So, yeah, I mean, and that's something to consider. But that's still a week, which is like two years. in, in my they also my never time. sent me a, a confirmation email. So, uh, good job. Let's talk. Great job. I'm really <laughs> impressed with the retailer that HTC chose to sell these phones. It, it just better than appeared. better than Google. Better than no, Google. That's true. Not hard to be better than Google. Uh, right. So, uh, you know, the bottom line is that I hadn't played with the GS4 yet because I, I didn't do the review. I didn't have a review unit. Uh, so I'm like, hey, you know, I'll, I'll go buy one. Uh, so I got, I got a white AT&T one. And it, it's weird because, like, every time I buy uh, a phone for full price from a carrier store, it's like I'm from another planet. Yeah. They're, they're like, like I, I go to buy it, and they're like, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Like, you, you, you're, you know, you're not eligible for an upgrade yet. I'm like, that's fine. And they're like, Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> it won't get me like like I'm like I'm insane. So uh, yeah, but I, I bought it, um, and the you know it's yeah, I, I have to agree with with everything David said. The one thing that I noticed, which which uh, maybe I don't know if it was the apps I was running or what, but like consistently it was stuttering. Like really? E- yes, everything I did, like just a simple like uh, screen transitions were stuttering, and it, and it's like that is so unacceptable when you're on. A, a, a Snapdragon 600 or any 2013 processor, like, yeah. what is what have they done so tragically wrong at the at the operating system level so that this is ha- like I totally get why Facebook had to rewrite the core of Android to make home work now. Like I yeah. get it. Well, and the the crazy thing is like Facebook Facebook did it. It worked. It's so smooth, and yeah. yet nobody else has figured this out. And and I noticed the same thing in the review. And like I don't know if you spent any time in the gallery. But for some reason, the gallery app is just broken. It's just slow and laggy and crashes all the time. And it's just like, it's all these little things that it's like, Samsung, you have so many powerful features and it does all this crazy stuff, yet you can't make it so that, you know, swiping home screens works perfectly every time. It's just right. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, anyway, uh, my GS4 is back in AT&T's hands now. All I, know is, was, I got an email from Chris on Sunday, and the subject line is, I did something horrible yesterday that I am ashamed of. <laughs> I, was. I, I was totally ashamed of it. Because like, I, I, I swore up and down that I wouldn't buy a GS4, that the one was the better phone, and I believe that it is, uh, as I think most of us do. But, um, you know, I hadn't played with GS4. I wanted to, so whatever. For 25 minutes. For 25 minutes. <laughs> 
Um, what else? Oh, so it's got an IR blaster, just like the one. And David, I know that, or not David, Dan, you're deeply in love with the IR blaster. Yeah, man, it's fun. Like yeah, you know, if you I read did, an article. You should. I I didn't I didn't think that I would like actually be using it on the one like when when these were all announced and they were like oh they've got IR blasters and I was like oh well that's stupid um, <laughs> and it was like you know well, what am I gonna do with that and then you know uh, I think both uh, Samsung and HTC have contracted Peel to write these television remote control apps and they work really great and I mentioned in my piece that these do not really replace your your standard remote that comes with your cable box or your DVR or whatever it is you have these days, uh, just because they don't support all of the functions. But if you're sitting on your couch, paging through your Twitter, uh, Twitter feed or your, your Facebook um, news feed or whatever while you're watching a TV show and you just want to quickly change a channel or mute it or turn the volume up or whatever, it's right there in your hand and it's like been super convenient and it was super easy to set up. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy with it and I think it's cool. Um, and it just it frustrates me, though. Like, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Harmony One user, and I, uh, my, my cable isn't really set up. Like, I, I think I've got like three channels, and because they're, the rest are encrypted and whatever. So, like, you know, I watch Apple TV, I watch Xbox, um, I want, I've got like my Mac Mini hooked up as a media PC, um, and you know, I want to like hit the button and have it go through the macros of launching all the right things in the right order and, and switching all the inputs. Um, and you know the apps don't do that, so like right. like I can get it to adjust volume. I guess I could st- try to program it, but I would really like. I know there's an SDK for this stuff, but I don't understand if these things are going to have IR ports. We should have, like Logitech should give up on their hardware thing. They basically have the, and just give us a remote app that works. They've got a remote app that works with their little repeater thing, um, but I would love to see somebody like actually try and do like a smartphone remote app properly now that there's hardware that have got good IR blasters on them. Because like well, the fu- there hasn't the been thing, right. The funny thing is that I think I can't remember what that repeater is called, I know what you're talking about, but it's it's discontinued already. Like it yeah. I, I I feel like it was in in production for like six months and then it, they discontinued it. I don't know if that was because oh, it's selling yeah, really poorly. I, I pulled a Ziegler on it. I bought one and used it for about <laughs> two days. I didn't return it though. I think it's sitting in a closet. Is it no good? It's terrible. The 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 delay on it. It's like it's like you hit a button and you wait ten seconds to, to hope it works. Oh. So that's like the kind of performance I expected from using my smartphone as a remote uh, through an IR blaster. But you know, it it hasn't been that in my experience. Now I think I might be wrong, but I think you can set up macros for the cable boxes and stuff that are supported like within the HTC app. So if you have a cable box and DVR that's supported by it. I think you can like go to like a watch TV setting. It'll turn your TV on. It'll turn your cable box on uh, with one button press. But it really is more useful to you if you are subscribing to a cable service or a satellite service or something that has a cable box instead of a mishmash of set-top boxes that you might have if you're a cord cutter. So I could see you definitely understand your frustration there uh, because it is not as fully featured as, say, like a Harmony remote. Right. Um, but like the whole observation is just that like, Ten years ago, every single phone practically came with an IR blaster, and and virtually every smartphone up until the iPhone, and then they were gone for like six years. And then this year, we've got the two top Android phones on the market, both have IR blasters. Uh, Samsung's built it into a number of its tablets. It did started that last year, I think, with the, the Note 10.1 had an IR blaster. Um, so it's just it's uh, it's just funny to see like yesterday's technology make a resurgence, even though it's got a slightly well, that- different purpose today. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say that's the 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 kicker there is that um, the the IR port ports that were on most phones before the iPhone were focused on Erda, and they usually didn't have enough output, like the the you know they, they weren't bright enough or whatever to like control uh, devices reliably. Like they were, you know, they were just intended for data transfer, and like it, you know, there were always like apps that were available to like turn them into remotes, but like they frequently didn't work because like they just weren't designed for that. So you had to get like really close to the components. So now like or the, the port the was IR- just on a bad spot on the phone, yeah, it was on the side or the bottom or something like that. Right, it just wasn't designed for that. Right. So these new ports are not only in the right place, but are designed to have sufficient power output to reliably control components from a distance. Right. Speaking of old school features on phones. Chris reviewed the Q10 with a uh, physical keyboard. I did. I did. Uh, it's it's a bold. 
I mean, it's, a real, it's a real bold move there they did, huh? huh? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I, I think my conclusion summed it up. It's like, if you use a bold and you love your bold, then yeah, go out and buy this Q10. Uh, and, you know, ignorance is bliss. You won't, you won't understand... The, the the features and the apps that you may be missing once you, I, once you I, I believe you mean Chris go out and buy this Q10 but still hang on to that iPod touch you're using for all of your apps and exactly music. that's right, exactly right, right. Uh, yeah. yeah no it's it's look it's it is hands down uh, the best uh, portrait qwerty keyboard that I've ever used which I think is what all of us probably expected uh, I don't oh, feel like we say that about that, that would have been bad um, yeah and, and the difference with the Q10 is that it's um, uh, it's it's wider than a bold than a bold ninety seven eighty so I, I think by a little bit so uh, you end up with a a slightly better keyboard um, but the clickiness is the same the shape of the keys is the same um, the screen is not great the the resolution is fine I have no problem with seven twenty by seven twenty uh, but it's very very dim even compared to the Z ten side by side which was a little surprising to me and it, it's AMOLED um, right it's not LCD if I'm not correct. Sorry. Correct, it's AMOLED. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the conclusion I drew is that, uh, you know, if, if you're either accustomed to using Portrait QWERTY or more specifically accustomed to BlackBerry, this is going to be a great upgrade for you. That's what you're into. Uh, but if you're accustomed to using an Android phone or an iPhone, I can't imagine, I, like, I can't formulate a, a good reason why I would recommend, conceivably recommend this device to any of those people. So I what, I was, I can't. what I was really curious about uh, reading your review was sort of the the idea that like it used to be that uh, physical keyboards were just kind of objectively better than software keyboards, but it seems like part of your argument was that we're not there anymore. Like I always, it seems yeah. like you know if you just attached a keyboard to, you know, the iPhone, it would be a better phone. But like maybe that's not true anymore. Right. It, no, absolutely, and I know that people like Sean Hollister will vehemently disagree with me on this, but... <laughs> Some are Sean. Uh, right there, guys. But, uh, no, you shaved his fist right there. <laughs> but, if, but if you, but if you, um, if you look at um, Swift Key, if you look at... Sw I love the, the new... I mean, I've always loved Swipe, but the new version of Swipe is so good. Um, but even the iOS keyboard... Um, it, Windows Phone has a notoriously good keyboard. It has since Windows mm -hmm. Phone 7, but it got better in 7.5 and 8. Um, any of these, to me, are better and more efficient ways of entering text at this point than a physical keyboard. That wasn't true five years. That certainly wasn't true five years ago, and I wouldn't have suggested no. otherwise. But but now I think the story has changed. So for me, a physical keyboard is it, like I I am faster on a, a virtual keyboard. But like the uh, the like feeling of of using it makes you feel like a boss. It makes you feel yes. like you're like I'm I'm typing. I, here I am working. And I'm doing exactly. some stuff on it. I feel fast, and that's awesome. And like, there's there's value to that. Uh, I was really hoping that their their whatever they're called, their quick actions or just type things, where you could like launch stuff with little keyboard shortcuts, mm -hmm. was a little bit more robust. Um, but it, well, I just it, don't I mean, see. Yeah, I, mean, like, I didn't see the advantage of like uh, going to the home screen and typing tweet and then my tweet instead of just going <laughs> to the Twitter app and typing my tweet. Like, I, I didn't get it. You well, they, it's it's, it's a ver it sounds like it's a version one. I mean, with uh, the old BlackBerry, you could assign, you could like go to the launcher and hold down a button and have it launch an app. So you could hold down T to launch Twitter. Uh, the way that they did it on on WebOS is you could um, you it would it would guess it would assign shortcuts. So, so instead of typing tweet da da da, you just hit like T space da 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 da. -da. Uh, so it was like like Alfred, I guess. So like you would you'd be able to do stuff a little bit more quickly with a little bit fewer key presses, um, or like M and, space and thing... message somebody. And actually, one thing that I, I, I will admit that of all the major platforms right now, I do think that BlackBerry 10, particularly 10.1, has the most robust universal search. Because, like, when, when you start typing um, a list of, uh, you know, actions, pieces of content like emails and text messages and apps all come up, um, uh, among other things. And when you tap and hold on any of those, it shows um, a, a, a row of or excuse me, a column of icons along the right side of the screen, and if you swipe over to those, it extend it expands to show like text of what that icon means, uh, and those are all the actions that you can perform on that item that showed up in, in search. So, right. like for example, if, if an email comes up, um, you know some of the options might be like reply to, like mm. you know open, all, you know those sorts of things. It's, it's a it's a context menu for universal search. Yeah, that's that's cool actually. Yeah. But not enough to make you feel like you 
we're still more effective and useful with this thing. Than right. We with a, right. That, that, that is the, that is the core outcome of this review is that it's like at no point did I have, I thought any productivity game game, but certainly not enough productivity game to justify sacrificing everything that you need to sacrifice to move from Android or iOS to BlackBerry 10. Right. So, does that make BlackBerry and particularly the the, the keyboards sort of like the AOL dial-up of the smartphone <laughs> industry, where literally all they can bank on now is that people it, it's sort of the inertia of like this is what I've always had. I don't want to get anything else because. <laughs> Until now, the keyboard was the only thing that was a convincing reason to buy a BlackBerry. Right. Um, and, you know, there have been others over time. There was security and there was email, and those have all been sort of pushed away, and then BlackBerry is now just really touting the keyboard. And if that's gone, like, what's, what do they have? What's left? Yeah, well, like I said, I mean, like, if you have a Bold right now and you love your Bold to death, please, by all means, go out and buy the Q10 because you are going to be head over heels in love with it. But... Yeah, outside that, I don't know how they're going to appeal to new audiences. Um, I think, well, but, so, but even that, like you're, you're sort of saying now that if even if you have a bold and you love it, kind of you know try something else because on-screen keyboards are great and they're better and we think you'll like that better. Uh, and that's sure, yeah. that that's sort of that's got to be scary for BlackBerry at this point. Yeah, no, well, so, so you know, obviously that's what they're trying to do with the Z10, right? Is like capture that audience that is outside their core right. um, in a way that the, the certainly the 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 torch never did, and and the storm, but um, but the uh, whole screen clicked. It was amazing. Yes, right. it did. Yeah, the, the screen. whole screen. Oh, I forgot about that. Oh my god, I can't <laughs> believe that actually happened. Um, so, <laughs> man, I totally forgot about that. So, so Dan is uh, Dan is actually uh, going to. It's not. It's not called BlackBerry World anymore, right? It's called something. BlackBerry like, Live. BlackBerry Live. BlackBerry yes. Live. Thank you. And so I think that's going to be what they need to do. We already know, uh, Torsten Hines has said before, that they're going to be showing, what, a total of six phones in 2013, I think? Uh, and, yes. And so the only way that they're going to be able to revitalize the BlackBerry user base and actually start adding people to it, I think, is to uh, really take the Q10 down market and do something really creative and innovative to like show people why this is the this so, is the, the right form factor, and then pull people into that ecosystem at a low price point, and then they can graduate. Right, right. The Q10 yeah. right now. They just I, need to release a portrait slider, and they'll take over the world. That's it. Because <laughs> they did that the first time around. I'm uh, telling you. The, the Q10, I mean, it's, it's priced at, I think, a suggested price of $250 on contracts. So this is very much not an entry-level device. This is, you are not, not, not even competing with, like, the first level of iPhone 5 or the, the One or the Galaxy S4, you're now competing with the upgrade version that gets you right. more storage. So it's like, as far as that price competitiveness, this is definitely not where... Well, hang on. I mean, that, that price, yeah, I mean, they'll bring it down for consumers, but Blackberries have always been way more expensive than they really had any right to be. So and maybe, I think, like, that but, price is there just so that they can convince CTOs but, to buy it. And BlackBerry 10 just needs to be good enough so that people won't flip a table and quit their job when they get handed to them but, at a corporation. But, but if, if BlackBerry you know, BYOD doesn't take over. But BlackBerry's <laughs> biggest success was with the entry level models. The Curve 8300 right. series was the one that BlackBerry sold millions upon millions upon millions upon millions on. For, and one. it like dragged out the death of the Curve series for eons because it couldn't figure out anything else to do. But that's where BlackBerry got all its market share. It wasn't selling bolds and it wasn't selling the high end or the 8700 or the 8800 or whatever it was that was priced at. Three hundred dollars on contract at the time. So if you know if, if BlackBerry wants to appeal to that entry level market, we need to see essentially a curve level BlackBerry ten device, uh, right. which we may see a BlackBerry Live. Hopefully, we'll see a BlackBerry Live, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. Well, the original plan was to continue to offer that kind of device as BlackBerry seven devices. I think it was like two years after the release of the the first uh, the, the the Z ten. Uh, I don't know if they can stick to that plan. I, yeah, I don't know if they can really release a BlackBerry 7 device in the U.S. market. They might yeah. be able to do that in the emerging markets, um, but in, like, North America and Europe where, you know, the people can buy an iPhone 4S for 100 bucks on contract or an iPhone 4 for free on contract, a BlackBerry 7 device is just going to get steamrolled. But also, yeah. re releasing a new BlackBerry 7 device would be deeply stupid on many levels because the, they need to be <laughs> spending every single drop of their energy right now beefing up the BlackBerry 10 ecosystem. They can't afford to divide their attention between two ecosystems right now, certainly. 
Um, and two, if they've coded themselves into an operating system that on its surface appears no better than Android that isn't capable of running on entry-level hardware, they've really screwed themselves. Because yeah. God knows that you can get an Android device for free. So if, if, well, if, I mean, you know, even if you look... saying that BlackBerry 10 is stuck on $200 on-contract hardware, then it's game Well, this over. hardware is not $200 dollar on contract hardware. If you're looking at like say the Z10, that's competitive with a Galaxy S3 that was released in June of last year. So I mean, right. it, it's for on a spec level, it's competitive with the hundred dollar Pantech, which is an entry level or mid range Android device. Uh, right. Why BlackBerry is insisting on charging the price premium, you know, uh, Dieter mentioned to maybe it's to just you know appeal to these these CTOs that need to buy them in fleets, but uh, it, it's definitely not giving you the same value that you get on an Android. Right. And uh, I guess, well, okay, so apparently the Q10 is selling well in the UK. Uh, they're expecting to sell tens of, mi tens of millions of them. Well, we don't know. Yeah, we don't Black know. Ray That's says it's plan. selling well, yeah. but we don't really know any numbers uh, yet. I mean, this thing will, I think this thing's going to outsell the Z10 for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because I would, it's, I would... it's an obvious, there's an obvious reason to buy it. Like, if you yeah. want a physical keyboard, buy this phone. Like, there, there isn't one like that for the Z10. It's like, if you sort of want a universal hub for your messages by the Z10. Like, I, I don't know why I would ever tell someone to buy that, whereas with Q10, there's at least, like, somebody's like, I like my physical keyboard. It's like, oh, buy a Q10. Right. Yeah, no, no one's like, I, I need to upgrade. No one's like, I need to upgrade from my Curve 9380. Or, like, I need to, right. I need to, upgrade, I need to upgrade from my Storm. Like, yeah. no one is saying... Well, okay, no, the Storm people are saying that. The Storm people were saying oh, that the boy. day they bought it. Yeah, I, if they haven't upgraded from their Storm, um, <laughs> I pity them uh, yeah. greatly, so... Uh, we can't talk about BlackBerry without talking about uh, the latest thing to come out of Torsten Heinz's mouth. Um, Torsten Heinz is like the new Eric Schmidt, just like oh, saying God. insane things. No, he's a, new, he's a new Mike Lazaridis. Yeah, because fair. it's like these statements well the statement today that has been in the news is that he says that uh, tablets will be uh, dead in five years which is kind of an insane thing to think about and then he's also elaborated and saying that uh, ta he views tablets as a poor business model because uh, the money is not where hardware is but it's with software uh, services uh, for these companies um, and th to be honest this is something that he's actually said a number of times maybe he didn't say in explicit words of you know dead in five years but he's really downplayed the importance of tablets for quite some time and said that uh, BlackBerry feels that the smartphone is going to be the convergence device that takes over and it crosses over to uh, between your laptop and you know your mobile and things like that um, but you know when you look at uh, Apple's balance sheet and you know where Apple is making tons of money and where every other company is trying to break into and, and grab some of that money, uh, a lot of that is in tablets. So it's it's hard to see this and not be like uh, that is just the insane hubris that we've heard from BlackBerry for the past five years. Well, I'm sure that you know he he was trying to maybe I'm I'm guessing that he's trying to speak in like these general terms about the future of computing. And that you know the phone is going to become the hub, and then you just have these terminals, and maybe it'll be a tablet, maybe it'll be a big screen at your desk. Basically, the exact same stuff that Jeff Hawkins was talking about back in the day with the Folio, right? Like um, I mean, uh, the BlackBerry spokesperson, uh, Alex uh, Katsella, said that uh, uh, the, the comments Torsten made are in line with previous comments he has made about the future of mobile computing overall, and the possibilities that come with a platform like BlackBerry 10. Like that's fine if you want to say, yeah, we don't know what the, what computing is going to look like, and in five years, not just mobile computing, but computing in general. Like it, it's going to be crazy, and what we're doing now is not what we're going to be doing. And get ready for you know innovation. Like that's fine, but um, you know, don't say tablets are dead because you know a tablet is dead as a playbook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or tablets are a poor business model because you know who they're a poor business model for? BlackBerry. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody well, not named Apple right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was, I was about Amazon. to say like like that's that's the weird thing about it is that like you can see if if you live in the this weird vacuum where you haven't used an iPad for an extended period of time, you could seriously make, you know, pretend to make the argument. I like to call that the, the John Rubenstein vacuum. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, famous for having claimed that he never used an iPhone, uh, which may very well be true. But, uh, but to this day, if you have never touched an iPad, you could seriously, I, like, I can imagine how Torsten Hines could be living uh, with those blinders on, but yeah, if he's only ever used the playbook, and uh, yeah. this is this is his tablet experience, then sure. 
Uh, but right. it is interesting to see that we've been maybe kind of thinking that uh, with the launch of BlackBerry 10 now out there, maybe we'll see a tablet device uh, from BlackBerry to go along with the new phones. And this kind of puts a big damper on those kind of hopes or anything like that. So Yeah. Well, what's funny is it makes me think that, you know, Torsten Hines makes me think that he thinks the, like, the pad phone is the future of computing. Um, and he may well be right, and I will be fascinated the day that, you know, BlackBerry comes out with whatever they feel like calling the pad phone. David, um, you love the pad phone. I do. I love the pad phone. The pad phone and I are best friends. We really are. I'm more of a phone pad guy myself. But, <laughs> but the thing is, like, I think Torso Hines might be right, ultimately, in, the, in that like, your phone will be the hub of all your data, and then you just sort of add Jeff on. Jeff Hawkins, pieces. man. He's just stealing it from Hawkins. Well, yeah, Hawkins <laughs> is right. And then there was, there was the Atrix, which tried to do the same thing. And like, people yeah. have tried, and like, this may well end up being the future of computing. But to come out and say, in five years, no one will have a tablet anymore, is just you just make yourself look dumb. Like, th yeah. there's a better way to say what he was trying to say. And, like, if I'm giving him as much benefit of the doubt as I can here, there's a better way to say what he was trying to say than to basically say, no one's going to buy an iPad in five years. I'm sorry, but the, if, if, if that's really going to be the case where, as, like, the phone is our hub of computing and we plug it into all these peripherals, uh, it's hard for me to see as BlackBerry as being the company that brings us there. Uh, you oh, know, no. uh, Google's going to do that way before then. And then, you know, Apple's been converging iOS and OS X for the past year and a half, and right. it looks like it's okay. going to happen I, even more. So I can't believe I'm saying this, but um, Qtix is a way better platform to make that vision a reality than Android is. That's true. Perhaps, like, but, you know, it, it, Google's just going to, like, shoehorn it, like it does with everything. So, you know, it, it, we're going it, it's very likely we've, we've, we've talked about this a number of times of the convergence of Chrome OS and Android. It just makes sense for Google to combine those businesses. So, uh, you know, and Google is so far ahead of where BlackBerry is uh, in the smartphone world, and it actually has, you know, laptop devices that it can try and converge with. That I think that Google is going to do it first, and it's going to grab the attention long before BlackBerry is able to. Um, okay, so coming up, we've got BlackBerry Live. Uh, we've got Google I.O., same time. Uh, we've got a, uh, a Nokia Lumia announcement. Uh, we've got WWDC. Uh, we've got an Xbox announcement. Uh, what else is coming up? That I'm, oh, CTIA. CTIA. Oh, it's God, in between. Is, yeah. yeah, there's going to be nothing happening there. But we'll yeah. be there. Computex isn't that Thumbs far up. off. Computex. Like, buckle up. It's going to be a crazy couple of months. Yeah. And I guarantee, um, you that, I guarantee you that we're going to see a pad phone for... At Capitex. <laughs> Mark my well, words. Well, wait. Has the Pad Phone 3 hit the market yet? That's uh, why we're going to see a Pad Phone 4. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I bought them all, which is why they didn't hit the market. They're all just in my apartment. <laughs> and I regret nothing. Oh, I'm really got folio on the brain. like Because like, plugging in a phone is stupid. It should just be, do it over wireless. It should just magically be in your pocket and work. Well, that like that's the most obvious use of NFC. Ever. Like if you just walk in, tap your phone, and sit down, uh, yeah, that that would be amazing. Right, well, that's, of, that's not the convergence device that these people are talking about, or at least what I read it as they're talking about. They're, what the, what Thor, uh, Heinz has been saying for so long is that we've got these laptop grade processors and graphics processing units and amounts of RAM in our phone, and why can't it power all of these other things? Unless there's some like wireless technology that I'm not aware of. I mean, if you're going to be doing all the processing level on your phone, uh, NFC or Bluetooth isn't really going to cut it as uh, a bridge to another device. Well, NFC direct, is just for the yeah. pairing, but then it uses Wi-Fi Direct or, you know, right. some other crazy... Like, there's plenty of wireless standards, and there's more coming uh, that would be able to have that kind of bandwidth. It's more an issue of battery life uh, but, but, you know, but and, like, still, designing the standard. No, but, but, but still, nobody, especially in the age of, like, family plan or, excuse me, not family plans, mobile share and cloud computing, no one has presented uh, a cognizant argument to me as to why... Uh, we should be trying so hard to converge our phone with anything. Like, give me a tablet, give me a phone, let me live my life. I don't need to... <laughs> because to Verizon and AT&T charge you $20 a month or $10 a month just to connect <laughs> your tablet. <laughs> hey, Dan, imagine the AT&T Death Star, sunglasses coming down, deal with it. Okay? <laughs> That's all I have to say. Um, 
Okay, so at WWDC, we should we should talk about Apple a little bit. Uh, we're going to see new versions of iOS, and uh, rumors have been going around. Nine to five Mac did it, and uh, WSJ did it a little bit before then. That it's definitely going to be flatter, all, all new icons, maybe uh, more glanceable information. Basically, all the unicorn dreams we've been hoping for for iOS um, have been put out there as as possible features and, and improved looks on it. Um, I mean, so, I genuinely believe that they're going to they they are going to try and make iOS seven look better and they're like right now the rumor is that we're still going to have the the grid o icons as the home screen because that's real and familiar but if they can genuinely do something with notification center and genuinely do something about either multitasking or just glanceable information uh, i think that'd be a really big deal well and, and i think if, if apple's smart they're they have to be really aware of this because like this this running narrative is you know Apple's lost its touch. iOS is boring. They can't do anything interesting. You know, Scott Forstall is out, uh, and now it's like Johnny Ive is here to he's you know the the white knight coming in to save the day. And the he first is literally day, a knight. Yeah, that's that's a fair, he's white <laughs> yes. too. So it's literally <laughs> actually so, accurate. <laughs> so the, the, there's been that narrative, but in reality, it hasn't really affected iOS device sales, has it? Because you know we had Apple's financial report recently, and they're selling more iPhones every single quarter than they did the previous year. Right, but I think what what's going to be interesting about WWDC is I think if Apple doesn't do what everyone wants them to do. I think this might be when things like when people actually start to be rightly upset and start to you know look elsewhere, um, because this is we're kind of at the point where like they've run out of excuses. Like Johnny Ive is supposed to be the best in the business. They're leaking all the right things. They're talking about all the right things. Um, but and then if they don't come out and do what we want them to do, then what? Like I'm I'm waiting for WWDC, and if they don't do what I want them to do, I'm going to go buy an Android phone. And I, I can't imagine I'm the only person. Like, I have this, and I'll get rid of it if they don't fix notifications and give me widgets. But Vine, David, how can you go to a platform without Vine? So exactly. you know how yeah. there's the... You, get the, little Android, new, you, know, yeah. you get the little new banner when you download an app for, for, for the first time? I downloaded Vine like three months ago, and it still has the little new banner on it. I've oh never used God. Vine. I don't know. You're missing, You're missing out, man. Out. Yeah, so front-facing vines, front-facing camera vines. Oh. Vine selfies. <laughs> vine selfies. Oh, okay, wait. Now I'm now I'm gonna get into Vine. The game is. <laughs> you have no idea what you guys just signed up for. <laughs> I mean, I I feel like uh, with regards to you know the people are upset if Apple doesn't do. I uh, people have been upset at like Apple not doing what they want forever, right? Like it took five generations to get a notification center of any sort. Uh, and, you know, every quarter Apple sold more iPhones than the last. So I, I, when it affects the bottom line and I could see, like, a decline in sales, then totally. But I don't, I don't know if it's gonna, that's really going to do it. People are happy with their iPhones. Yeah, but, it, it, I mean, critically, uh, Johnny Ive is in charge now, like David said. I mean, like, it, internally the game has changed. Even if they're, they're not concerned about... Uh, the bottom line um, and and the you know the trajectory of the product and of the company, which frankly they don't have a ton of reason to be considering their their circumstances. Um, I think that it was enough of a shakeup so that um, you're going to see. I mean, Johnny Ive is 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 perhaps the most influential industrial designer of the past 25 years at this point, and clearly he's going to want to put his fingerprint all over this software. Um, and we've heard countless rumors of literally him. Johnny Ives fingerprint. Instead of brushed <laughs> yes. metal, you'll have swirls of. Uh, Johnny well, there's Ives. those rumors that there will be a fingerprint sensor on the 5s. Oh, there you go. fingers on. Fingerprint. I, I don't. Right there. I, I don't believe that for a second. By the way, that, that's like the, that is the most Samsung thing that Apple can do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we we also saw how well the fingerprint sensor worked out for uh, Motorola with the Atrix. On the Atrix. Yeah. But. Uh, <laughs> But so, so you know, I, I think that he is going to be looking. We heard countless rumors that uh, that he hated Forstall and and hated his, his the the direction that he was taking the platform. So I thoroughly believe uh, pretty much everything that uh, Nine to Five Mac is reporting about um, about iOS seven right now. I hope so. Yeah, I'm I'm actually really excited because I can switch back to my uh, my my iPhone and. I mean, I you know I've been using it quite a bit, but you know I've got this orange phone, man. I want to show it off. Be cool. Um, 
So I don't know what else we talk. Oh, uh, Google Now is on the iPhone, and it's like it's not that good. Like it, it's pretty. It's weird that they got the cards at the bottom. Um, it it pings. It turns on your location thing, uh, so it's not running GPS all the time. But because it checks location in the background, it looks like you're you're sucking down your battery, and I guess it probably pulls it down a bit more. Uh, but it doesn't do background notifications. It doesn't do doesn't you know ping notifications. So it's just sort of like there are some cards there if you want to look at them. Which for some reason, just that little difference of like you've got to go look for them uh, makes them way less compelling yeah. than uh, it is on Android. Yeah, the fact that it doesn't do any sort of notifications kind of blows my mind. Like I I, I would have expected it to do uh, something. You know, the notifications on Android are very passive. I guess as passive as a notification could possibly be because they yeah. just kind of show up in your notification center without really like making the phone vibrate or sing or whatever. Um, but there's none of that on iOS. So unless I think to actively open the app and check it, um, you know, it just my my life carries on. Yeah. Um, oh, no, uh, Apple had their earnings we talked about earlier. And uh, on the call, Tim Cook, uh, well, he did a couple of things that was weird. Uh, one, he, he kept talking about the iPhone 4. Um, and then he also said that uh, he would not make a bigger iPhone, uh, iPhone with a bigger display unless he could solve all the trade-offs that uh, everybody else is willing to make. And the biggest one was probably, uh, you know, app design. Uh, so it, I think it pretty much shut down the rumors of a, a larger screen iPhone. No, I Although completely I, disagree. I, but, I completely but, disagree. But, 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 it would, I would not put a pass in to be to be able to come out and say we all these terrible trade offs. We solved it because we're exactly. Apple. We're amazing. Exactly. Right. Well, that, that that's exactly the same thing hap- that happened with netbooks. Uh, you know, uh, the exact same verbiage that Steve Jobs always used from netbooks, and then we finally got the 11-inch MacBook Air. And I think we're going to have the same We're thing just, happen. like, really stretching the definition of a netbook because you're comparing a $250 computer with a $1,000 computer. But... Yeah, but... but it's, I, it's I would still... actually be shocked if we saw it this year because just because just this fall was the first bigger iPhone that's ever happened. So I'd actually be yeah. really surprised if the very next generation was even larger. Um, right. But, you know, that doesn't rule it out for something further down the line. Yeah. Could they do, like, a 1024 by 768 big 4 by 3 iPhone? Would that be the worst thing ever? And then just use, like, iPad apps? The it sounds like a great idea in my head. Have you, have you ever used a 4 by 3 phone? Yes, it was awful. I put <laughs> oh, sushi on it and took pictures of it. <laughs> I think of the Pantech Pocket and then, of course, the LG View. And oh, both of those. Oh, hang like on. Most... Don't hate on The Pantech Pocket was awesome. They no, were the it was most such un- a piece. Un- ergonomic, <laughs> like, like ergonomically incorrect devices ever. It was such a piece. Everything about it from the skin <laughs> to the materials to the shape. The shape was just hilarious. Like, I couldn't help but lol every time I pulled the phone out. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you want to live in a future where, like, you're carrying, like, crazy, like, diff- like not all devices need to be... Uh, you know the, the the standard aspect ratio of a phone. No, like, like I'm watching Star Trek. Hang on, I'm hang on, hang on. I'm watching Star Trek Next Generation. Like Hulu put together this playlist where you could automatically queue up all of the Q episodes and all of the Borg episodes and not watch the rest of the stuff. So no I'm like way. grinding through. Yeah, it's great. Um, and so I'm like grinding through a whole bunch of old school Star Trek Next Generation shows and like they're holding like the tricorder and their phaser. I'm like, man. We used to imagine a future where we like made devices of different sizes, and we're not doing that anymore. Like everything looks like this, you know. Everything looks like this. Like, like, come on. Like, I, I've got you know a couple other extra inches I could you know extend no, my hand. I, I, I hear you, Dieter. Uh, and uh, and you know, uh, mixing it up would be great. And and new devices and designs and maybe something flexible to screen and and make our dreams come true with that. But you know, the the fundamental problem with the view and the pocket is that if you ever tried to use it with one hand, it was an absolute nightmare. Like it's, well, you it's, just use a holster, man. That's what they even, do on Star Trek. Just... <laughs> a lot of good ideas here, Dieter. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's even worse than trying to use a Note 2 with one hand, because it's like they're, they were just so wide and so ridiculous. Okay, so so we're, we're all going to be using square open WebOS devices and holsters, is what I'm hearing. Oh my about, god. Dieter. Yes, that is exactly what I I'm want. I'm in. Yeah, I can't wait. Uh, you should go if you haven't. Uh, Pre Central, I'm sorry. Uh, WebOS Nation has the uh, the Windsor Not photos of the Windsor Not up, so you can go and, and Which see. Which I, I love. The, that is like the best code name ever. Yeah, yeah any really phone is. ever. So the Windsor was the Pre Three, and this is not the Windsor. It's the Windsor Not. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, 
there's a whole bunch of, I guess we should, we've got a bunch of other like random stuff to grind through and we've been going for almost an hour, but I, we, we do need to talk about some carrier stuff. Uh, looks like the T-Mobile Metro PCS merger is a go. I mean, does anybody have anything in interesting to say about that? Uh, we, I mean, I hate to not point it out. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing I would say about that is that, um, uh, you know, this, this doesn't change the game for T-Mobile. It just allows them to proceed with what they've basically been promising for the past six months uh, in yeah. terms of their their LTE rollout. So it's, you know, this is effectively the status quo, and it's, what you know, what they've been saying would happen. So right. here we are. Um, and meanwhile, like, the Clearwire Sprint SoftBank dish fiasco still won't die. Like, there's still stories coming out about... SoftBank says it's okay for Sprint to change their agreement so they can sign an NDA with Dish to talk about their thing for Clearwire, and then Clearwire borrows some money, so Sprint is more likely to be able to do the buyout, so Dish can't <laughs> get in there. Like, it, it's just, it continues. And like, if we get a definitive, like, Sprint's buying Clearwire, SoftBank gets Sprint by the end of May, like, I'm taking the rest of the year off because <laughs> there's nothing left for yeah. me to write about. I'm done. Um... So anyway, that's coming. Um, and then Verizon's trying to buy uh, the rest of the wireless unit out from Vodafone, but they're arguing over the pricing. Uh, it's a hundred billion offer. Vodafone thinks it's worth one hundred and twenty or thirty or something. What's um, you know what's thirty billion a month? Yeah, you know, right? Yeah, whatever. We're all friends um, here. So that's all happening. But as long as we're talking about like high level stuff, we should also mention that uh, rumor has it that uh, we're going to have the new FCC chairman. It's gonna be a guy named Tom Wheeler, and like I don't, I, I, I know li literally nothing about this guy. Yeah, before the uh, before we started the uh, the show today, I think we we established three facts about this man. <laughs> he, he, we did some, he, uh, some very quick CTIA. Wikipedia research. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he was the CTIA president before uh, Steve Largent, I think, who is the current so that president. I mean, that gives me some serious pause, right? I'm not. A, I'm not a huge fan of the CTIA as a, a, a policy group. Uh, like I, I hate going to their conferences and having to sit through their videos talking about how evil taxes are on mobile carriers. Um, you know, I, I I just don't believe that the CTIA has a consumer's best interest at heart. Uh, well, no, them. I mean because they're the allowed to for the carriers, interest. right? Yeah, right, right. right. Um, uh, but what what always cracks me up about the CTIA is that you know their their membership includes both like. You know, AT&T and Verizon, and also these like micro carriers that serve yeah. like a thousand people. So like, they will frequently abstain on like really hot, huge policy issues because they don't want to piss off like you know half of their membership. <laughs> so so like they end up actually taking a hard line on like two issues, and like <laughs> everything else are just like ah, oh, you know, whatever, and they they wave their hands. <laughs> They are good for telling us how many text messages have been sent every year, though. So yes, they are very effective at that. So, yeah, he, he used to be the CTIA president. He uh, was for the AT&T T-Mobile merger, which yeah. is arguably not a good sign. And uh, what was the third fact? We knew one more thing about him. He was a lobbyist. Yes. A lobbyist, so, uh, yeah. Uh, and apparently he, we have a, Addy Robertson wrote a good piece on, the, on our site about that. Um, and he, he sounds like he's very much not a surprise, and it has sort of been the de facto first name that came up ever since Janikowski stepped down. Uh, and he was part of the Obama presidential transition effort, and so this guy's like, he's been around. And even though it, it's weird, people are like worried about him, it seems like, but it's just sort of going to happen anyway. Well, and also he's Obama's pick, so I can't, like, I, I would not associate, like, a super pro big business guy as being, like, Obama's first pick to run the FCC. Uh, yeah. So maybe there's, there's some part of the story that we don't know yet. Yeah, well, and, and like, opinions are mixed out. Like, like, public knowledge seems to like him. Free press doesn't. So, like, I don't know. We'll just have to see. Uh, okay. But, I mean, the other thing is, like, now that the T-Mobile AT&T merger fell through, like, other than, like, allocating Spectrum, I mean, I guess there might be some crazy thing happening to Sprint because there's always some crazy thing happening to Sprint that he might have to preside over, but... 
I mean, are there any, is always tied up in drama. At all yeah, what are the, the giant totally <laughs> screw over the consumer from the wireless industry perspective things that you expect the FCC is going to be weighing in on in the next few years? Uh, so there's auctions coming up for yeah. Spectrum. Uh, they yeah. really screwed the pooch on the 700 megahertz one, and that's really we're feeling the hurts of that now because you can't use your AT&T LTE phone on Verizon and vice versa. Um, so if that doesn't get sorted out properly, then yeah, we could really definitely feel negative effects with consumer uh, if it goes in the interest of the businesses and the companies that are, will be using it, um, as it did with the 700 megahertz block. Right. Right. Uh, um, Motorola, they lost a, a patent case against Microsoft, and so like instead of getting four billion a year, they're getting like what, like one hundred and seventy million or something ridiculous. Yeah, they're getting tiny. some pocket change. Yeah, it might as well yeah. be like six dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, so if you haven't read Neil's piece uh, about why, why does anybody know why uh, Google bought Motorola? Um, it seems like all the answers that have been floated, like if the. If the these were the reasons they were really bad reasons and Google should have known better. Um, well, you know, I was, I was just thinking about this uh, the other night. It, uh, if, if Google had not bought Motorola, how much longer could they have survived as, as, as a, an independent maker of, of phones? Because, right. like, what did they do? Well, like, I, I, they, don't, I don't know exactly how much money they had in the bank, but since Google bought them, they've lost money every single quarter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I just can't wait for, like, Google's spring cleaning announcement 2016 where they just, like, have a one line that says, and we're closing Motorola down. <laughs> we're closing Orkut. And oh, by the way, we're closing Motorola. People will care less about that than they did about Google Reader. I promise <laughs> oh, that's so sad, but true. No, but I mean, you know, maybe it, it, you never know. It's Google. Uh, they could very easily uh, rejuvenate that division and do some cool things with this rumored X phone that we keep hearing about. Uh, this year, who knows? Yeah, I mean, isn't you know, that I, enough? Like, if Google does, if if they do come out with this, you know, stock phone that's durable and just the right size, um, it, it doesn't seem like it would be that hard for Google to justify this twelve point five billion dollar purchase if they like actually want to make a real play into Android hardware. Uh, well, they don't though. They don't they do what would, they want. They would have to be hugely profitable and hugely successful. For quarter, like a long string of quarters, in order to make back that twelve point five. Well, but they wouldn't, and that's the investment. beauty of being owned by Google. Is Google just makes so much money off of other things that they can just kind of do whatever they want. And like this is an easy way for Google to start making cool phones that like Larry Page can now carry around the Googleplex, and like maybe that's worth twelve point five billion dollars to Larry Page. Uh, and if it is, then you know I'm happy for him, and I'll probably buy his phone. Um, but I don't know. I mean, this this patent war thing is is increasingly interesting and and does seem to be kind of a giant swing and a miss from Google and Motorola. But I mean, until they've what did they say it was an eighteen month product line that they acquired from Motorola? Until they've exhausted that and sort of seen what comes next, I don't know. You're currently being trolled by uh, Ross Miller there. Uh, Hello. <laughs> It's a nice tie Ross is wearing. Though. I was really trying to read what his card said. I, I believe it said hello. hello. Yeah. Hi, it's a good, yeah. Is that, are those, those cue cards necessary for when he does, does 90 seconds? The first one is Oh, hello. yeah, Ross can't remember they're just, anything. They're, Ross has cue oh, cards for a broken one word. Their one word cue card is It's like that Ross Bob Dylan video. Muller, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a very long time, but we love Ross, so we do it. It's okay. We do love Ross. We do. We miss him. I'm just, we should uh, have him on the show. We, we totally should. Uh, in fact, uh, yes, let's book it. Uh, next week, okay. he's going to be captive. Um, <laughs> so I'm looking at Motorola's site right now. So I, I was secretly hoping that they still made... They don't appear to, but until very recently, they were still offering a Windows Mobile 6.5 uh, device through Sprint. Um, and I just, like, it, it gives me... It gives me uh, great pleasure knowing that Google makes a Windows Mobile 6.5 device, <laughs> but I, I, I don't think they actually sell it anymore. I think they finally discontinued it. However, uh, both the Razer Max HD and the Razer HD are WebTop compliant, which I did not know. What is... Oh, man, they still make Bluetooth crap, too. The Motorola Sonic Rider. Chris loves his Motorola Bluetooth crap. <laughs> yeah, the, the S11 is, like, hands down the best 
uh, stereo Bluetooth headset on the market right now. That's true, really? actually. That is definitely true. Maybe they should Google should get into headphones. Yeah, just there's that. your twelve point five billion dollars. Right. <laughs> Drop all this other stuff. Just get into headphones. Also, the S11 supports aptics, which I really wish the iPhone 5 had, but it doesn't. Could you uh, imagine a, a Google Glass uh, device like designed by Motorola? It would be like all giant and Kevlar and heavy, and, <laughs> and it would just like slice your brain in half. And it would, it would have like instead of the little uh, tiny little screen thing that the glass has now, it, it would just like cover your whole eye. <laughs> yeah. Wait a second. Hold on. Hold on. Hang on. Wait. Uh, it looks like Motorola does... This can't be through mobility, but they're selling baby monitors through what? the Motorola mobility site. Motorola yeah. makes some of the highest rated baby monitors on the market. You would know, being that you're a parent. You're the only parent on the... Yeah, uh, you the know, they're, they're, they're a little pricey, but if you're in the range of a few hundred dollars for your baby monitor, I think Motorola is like one of the best ones you can buy. <laughs> Do they run webtop? Ah, uh, No. They should. Mm. See, that's a missed I mean, opportunity right there. Seriously, like this super high-end one, this uh, MBP36 remote wireless video baby monitor, looks like a like a full-on like tablet. Yeah, it's, like, they're like they're like three and a half inch or four inch screens. It's like yeah. And like, I, I definitely much. I definitely want to play Angry Birds <laughs> on this baby monitor. Chris, you should have kids, and then boom, there you go. Do you really need kids to buy a baby monitor? Is it creepy no. to buy a baby monitor if you don't have kids? Okay. <laughs> well, what are you going to monitor? Like your plants? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. She's going to check in. He's going to put there. He's going to put on. on, on I'm going to monitor. I'm going to monitor side. myself. <laughs> no, I'm monitor myself. I'm going to turn the camera facing me. Anyway, this is getting behind of it. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, that, ladies and gentlemen, has been the Verge Mobile Show. We want to thank you very much for listening. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, I am Backlon, Chris is Z Power, Dan is DC Seifert, and David is Pierce David. Yep. Not David Pierce. No. And, and Companion Core. And, and Companion Core. I don't know who that is. If you, whoever you are, out yourself so I can be your best friend because you're much better at Twitter than I am. Uh, we are at Verge. Uh, Vlad, who uh, we miss dearly, is uh, Vlad Savov. Uh, not Vladwick, although you can follow Vladwick too, uh, which is pretty uh, amazing. You have to follow and, both Vlad and Vladwick, though. It's yeah, because there's always, it's always a one-two punch with yeah. those two. Uh, <laughs> we also don't know who, who Vladwick is. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we'll probably be back next week. It's Like I said earlier, it's going to be a crazy couple of months, so if our schedule starts to get a little bit unreliable, please don't get mad. But uh, we'll do our best, folks. Thanks. Later.